Bonjour. Bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Well, really pleased to have you here today. Thank you for uh, signing up this morning. We had already over 100 persons who had signed up on the Zoom link. So good afternoon, everyone. Also to those who are following us on Facebook, because we are currently being streamed live on Facebook. And I would like to say hello to those who will see us in replay too. We'd like to say hello to all our guests today, those persons who have accepted to uh, speak at this webinar. A few weeks back, I was in Bordeaux, France, in the framework of a meeting with um, uh, people, uh, couriers, delivering uh, food, uh, meals to the families. And I was at Place de la Victoire in Centre Bordeaux with many restaurants and many uh, uh, couriers there. And their delivery professionals. And there was a tent of Resto de Coeur, an NGO that does distribution of food uh, to the homeless. And in 10 minutes time, we saw seven couriers with a delivery bag with their bicycles in 10 minutes who actually went there in the meantime to get a food uh, a package. So in between two deliveries that they would give food to people where we saw that even them didn't have enough money to, to buy food for themselves. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic that we've experienced for a year now has shown the great precariousness of the working conditions of the digital platform workers. And so we have seen that these careers who have a status of a freelance worker, a self-employed, could not just have a part-time uh, part uh, unemployment benefit and they had to work at any cost. And it's important, their activity is important when we are under lockdown because people get food delivered to their homes. And we still see that today in France. Uh, if you are not French, we should know that we have a lockdown in France started at 6 p.m. So food delivery allows the restaurants to keep working and the people who are at home to get food and a meal at 6 p.m. Okay, this has allowed us to become aware of the situation that also we cannot allow these workers to remain in this harsh situation that they're experiencing. What is the situation about? Well, these are platforms which are supposed to work as middlemen or intermediaries between companies and workers. Uh, and so the clients should be able to access a food service and the platforms are intermediaries between uh, the client and the restaurants. But when you look at this in depth, we see that the platforms are not only intermediaries, the platforms play a different role. They play a role when it comes to the setting the conditions of the service. They set the rate of the service, for example. Two weeks ago, I was with uh, uh, some uh, truck drivers at the Ministry of Economy in France, in Paris, and the driver said, look, we want to work freelance. We are officially freelance, self-employed. We want to be self-employed, but we have the feeling that we're just slaves to the mayor. Why? And Brain Ben Ali, their leader, uh, said that he would compare this to the Pokemon games. You know, he said, okay, when we work with Uber, well, at their office, there are people there who see VTCs, so uh, the riders in Paris, like as a group of Pokemons, and they decide on the algorithm that will determine their work missions. So they said this one and that one, he denied, he didn't want this race, uh, this, uh, um, this job, so we will not give him this mission. This one takes a lot of uh, jobs, um, cheap jobs, so we'll give him more. But there's no transparency on the conditions, the measures and the content of the algorithm. So I spoke about uh, the careers in Bordeaux, southern France, and you have Arthur A, who was, on, well, was one of the speakers for today. They were fed up with that situation, working freelance, but without uh, this uh, submission link to the platforms that they had been working for. They had no rights uh, in return. So they decided to create a cooperative company. They created a co-op with this uh, status of a wage earner, and it would create an alternative to Uber. So people get mobilized everywhere. I spoke about Arthur, who created uh, this uh, movement, this co-op uh, with the different careers, former Deliveroo, with CGT, our union, uh, a union. So um, from 
home delivery meals and they're not among the speakers because we're two twos speakers, because we have representatives from the Paris delivery services with Jérôme Dino, who's organizing um, careers uh, around France, including Saint-Etienne. And so platform workers are getting mobilized across France and they say, no, let's stop this. We want different working conditions. So as, an, uh, as a member of parliament, this is useful for us to see the struggle on the field because it's a counter power to the pressure of the platforms, which are well organized and strong. So we try to, to face these lobbies. Uh, in December 2019, at the European Parliament, we organized a transnational forum of alternatives to Uberization. We invited around 100 platform workers, uh, careers, bike riders, and um, Uber type of drivers. And that could create an international network that would enable them to uh, make sure that they would be heard and make sure that they would be a counterweight to the pressure of platforms because we know platforms are ready to fight they're ready to shoot to avoid taking up their responsibilities as employers and we remember the california example you know california in the united states has a law that imposes platforms to give their workers the same rights as just any other worker and we saw how these platforms have invested 200 million dollars to actually uh, cancel this through a referendum. So in the framework of this webinar today, which is about the digital uh, platform workers, we're looking for national law legislations and also at the European level. So we'll ask ourselves questions about the law in our member states uh, of the European Union, but also at the EU level as a whole within the EU law framework. Because this is a problem we think across Europe and every year, everywhere across Europe, the courts of justice confirm there is a problem when it comes to this official status of freelance workers or self-employed because they have no guarantees of autonomy. They're subordinate to the company, but there's nothing in return. The companies don't take up their rights, actually. And among here, we have Bob, among us, we have Barbara Gomez, who has a PhD in law, and she's a specialist in Uberization. And she will get uh, more information to us about case law and. Um, EU jurisprudence on this. So she will explain what were the specific cases where judges said that these people should not be considered as freelance workers. So Barbara will uh, shed a new light for us on this. Like I said, there were uh, legal initiatives in the different member states of the European Union. Let's start with France. In France, the French government is wondering how to get out of this ambiguity this vagueness uh, when it comes to the status of platform workers and actually uh, will face their precariousness. So the government asked Mr. Jean-Yves Frain, who's present today, sir, it's an honor to have you with us today. And Mr. Frain has received a mandate, a mission from the prime minister to actually think about in the law, a way to solve this legally and face the different possibilities that we could have when it comes to working on these workers' status. This is a spe special parliamentary mission that had been expected for months. So Mr. Fran will explain the very content and the founding of his work. Now, still in France, I'm also pleased to have here my colleague who's a member of French parliament, who is Daniel Obono. Daniel uh, Obono is a member of the EU Affairs Committee and she co-wrote a report on the working conditions of platform workers and she will get back to the findings of that report. And then, of course, she speak about the latest legal uh, novelties in France. Now, we don't want to stick to France, so we'll see what goes on in our neighboring countries, like in Spain. In Spain, our neighbors with the Ministry of Labor, they're actually considering the implementation of um, a new uh, legal step forward when it comes to protecting the working conditions of platform workers. And there we'll listen to Francisco Trio Paraga, who's a, an academic specializing in urbanization and works in close relation with the Spanish Ministry of uh, Labor. And uh, Francisco will tell us about the situation in Spain where a choice was made. It was decided to give the platform workers a status and give them by default the status of employee. So there are different legal solutions. There's a great array of solutions, actually. And we are asking people to carry out missions, you know. And we had tabled a mission, which was an option with the third type of status, a status in between that of an employee and of a self-employed person. We're getting away, walking away from this possible solution, I believe. And as we will hear in the next presentations, we see another way to go 
another avenue which is mentioned in the FRA mission, which is, would be wage portage. This is something which has been experimented in Portugal. This is why we asked Maria da Pasca and Posima, uh, who ex will explain what happened in Portugal, if it was efficient. And for my part, it, it was my commitment. And this is what I'm asking you to discuss in the framework of this seminar. Well, I speak about the EU level. And I think we either have to say it's a wage earner's status or a self-employed worker status. So we'll get back to this. And I submitted a draft directive to the EU Commission, which would enable us to give platform workers the same rights as just any other employed worker. And so I propose that Barbara Gomez takes the floor. She will explain the content of this directive because this is not something I wrote on my own. Uh, I had the contribution of a group of experts on Uberization, including Barbara Gomez. So she will explain the content of this uh, draft directive. And I will finish by saying that this draft directive is a contribution to the debate because you know that we are MEPs, members of the European Parliament, but we don't have the right to take a legal initiative. We have to wait for the EU Commission to come up with a proposal that we will amend. And when the EU calendar, the European Commission will come up with a proposal by the end of the year, then we're moving toward a draft directive that would be binding for the member states. So it means that it would have to be transposed in the national laws of the member states. And when it comes to the parliamentary and legal calendar of the EU Parliament, I'm hosting here my dear colleague, Sylvie Brunet, who's an MEP from the Renew Group, and she's also a member of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee. She's the rapporteur on this work that we're doing on digital platform workers at the European Parliament. And Sylvie is going to present what is at stake with the report, the calendar, and the time frame, of course, at the European Parliament. So we'll explain uh, this to you, we'll share our views, we'll explain what our stance is and what is our feed for action, of course. Uh, we all have different uh, hats and we have different interests according to our parties, of course. Remember that you can ask questions and, co and send comments through the chat box on Facebook or on Zoom. I will ask the speakers to uh, limit the time which has been set for their speeches. And again, thank you. Thank you everyone for your participation to this webinar. And without further ado, I will now give the floor to Arthur Hay, who is the secretary of CGT Delivery, the French trade union, and will explain the situation and working conditions of careers in France. So Arthur, what is your viewpoint on the workers' uh, status when it comes to platforms? You have the floor, Arthur. Well, hi everyone. Well, thank you, Leila, for giving me the floor at this event. As expected, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the situation of careers on the field. I'm the Secretary General of the Bordeaux Union for uh, uh, careers. I'm also in charge of the national group of careers who gathers different unions like CGT in France. So delivery workers and platforms. We, we see the differences, legal differences from a country to another. That's the first point. And I think we need to take the status of micro entrepreneur, as we call it in France. This status was created by Mr. Noelli around 10 years ago. And Mr. Novelli, a former minister, is now the spokesperson, is paid for actually by the platforms and is the president of the Association of Platforms, which are the worst platforms in the country, I believe. So when you are a micro entrepreneur, you have a commercial contract with an employer, that's the platform, and it's a commercial contract. So as workers, you're not covered by the labor law. So it makes it easier for the platforms to exploit you as a worker. So how will the platforms perform? Well, today, most platforms are, drink, are going to pay us per task. So it's a uh, payment that will enable us to get paid when we are delivering something. And they will not be paid for the whole day. This is not a paid uh, fixed payment. It can change according to the mission. And generally speaking, it goes down. Uh, we've been working with this union for four years now in Bordeaux. And on a regular basis, we've seen that wages would go down. 
or Uber, Uber Eats and, and Stuart Chair and others. They all have their specific features, but they actually have the same framework for exploitation. So this is a situation they pay us less and less. So they ask fig for figures per hour. It's hard to say, but it's around nine to 10 euros per hour. Of course, this is a turnover. It's not even your net income. So here we have uh, specific workers who will have to pay tax on that and social benefit, you know. Now the platform is not taking up its responsibilities as an employer. So they're not paying for their fair share of those contributions and benefits. So it decreases uh, the strength of those shares that create in our coverage. And for example, we don't have the right to get uh, for an employment benefit. So today uh, the careers are afraid of their situation. They're afraid of not having enough money at the end of the month. And as it was said, they have to go to the so-called resto du coeur, this NGO that gives them out food to eat. And they're afraid of just losing what they have, their job, because platforms today find it so easily or find it so easy to get rid of their workers and they just can swap workers. And it happened to me when I created the union, they got rid of me, period. They just said bye-bye. So this creates more precariousness because if you look around yourselves, well, you go and see an owner, if you want to rent a flat, he'll say, yes, but maybe you're making 1500 euros uh, if you work 65 euros a week, but I cannot rent out my apartment because I'm not sure that you'll keep your job. Maybe you will lose your job because we're working for a digital platform. So it's hard to rent a place or even buy a place uh, uh, for people who've been doing this job for four or five years the banks will not follow them. So the owners of apartments or the banks who would like to who have to lend us money, they're really aware of the situation. They understand the precariousness of the job much better than the politicians apparently. So this is the situation. No access to unemployment benefit, no look into the future and increasing precariousness. So today, who are the careers working for those platforms? Well, that's the people who have no choice. Today, in most of our countries, we are facing increasing precariousness. Unemployment figures are high and it's hard to work. So it's a very complex situation to make ends meet with this type of job. And I believe the platforms would not have been able to work with such a system in those countries without precariousness. That's the situation. So these platforms have taken up an opportunity that we have precarious people. And these platforms are well protected by the government, which is trying to, to make time for them. And as Leila put it, the highest courts of justice in some countries, including France, have already taken a, a ruling. They have already ruled on this. So we are uh, wage earners, not uh, self-employed workers. We see that in the way we work. So we have very little margin for maneuver in reality and we don't choose our rates. We don't set our own rates. We don't set our own, uh, simply our own um, missions. So we have, we depend on them. So when I said that this platform work is based on precariousness, this is something we see clearly with an increase by 6% of uh, creation, the creation uh, in the figures of uh, in the creation of companies. This is due to the increase of micro uh, companies, micro entrepreneurs, actually in the field of transport. So this is us. It shows that many people are working as a micro entrepreneur uh, for Uber and others and else. So they, so today we see this is not just that we people want to become entrepreneurs. People are more precarious. That's the situation. So I wanted to speed up and speak about an, an, an alternative that we studied with my colleagues, because we believe in the power of unions uh, to get new rights or to make sure our rights are being respected actually, because we need to work as a, a employed workers in France. And we've looked further. We created the Coursier Bordelais, which is a co-op a cooperative company for careers and we work with the Federation of Careers now 
We are present in seven countries with 60 co-ops or groups and together they uh, try to share their means. So they do contribute to the same uh, service. So together we work with developers, web-based services, etc. We share our means. We are really opposed to the exploitation of platforms. This is a counter model. And we say that we can oppose this blackmailing by the platforms, you see. So you say, okay, if you use that system, we'll do something better. And we can prove people that we provide a, a, a social, fair and environmentally friendly alternative and also one that's profitable because this is the way we want to go so it's like a, a profitable company system and it works well with this co-op so when we propose a co-op alternative and this is the solution we propose and this is what we propose to mr fra we'd like to regulate the sectors that riders and bikers have more rights and so they could actually work through a co-op or go through wage portage. So as a trade union member, I'm a bit shocked, but not surprised by the proposal made because the objective of the government is to find a solution that will protect the platforms, that will protect uh, the employers and who have no responsibility. You see what I mean? So the workers, the workers want healthy and secure conditions and the platforms don't want to provide for that. So we speak here about training, uh, the right scooters or bicycles, the right equipment to do the job. Also, it's all about access to social security system, uh, including retirement, okay? Because many people are young when they work on those platforms, but they have to think about the future because um, you're, the, the tax you pay today will pay for the retirement of those who retire now. The, the model uh, is not working like that now. And we're outside the solidarity system that supports social security. So we hear that there could be wage portage and other systems. What do I see through that? I see a barrier between the employer's responsibility and the worker. So there are intermediaries that take up for the responsibility, but it's not a cooperative like ours, which look for alternatives which are designed and created by workers and owned by workers, even run by the workers, they propose something very different. So here, they're just, you know, luring us. It's a lure. Uh, and of course, they say that Chris will have the status of a wage earner, but they will not be wage earners working for their employer. And it's a big problem, I believe. It's a big problem because the, the companies will do what they want. They will impose the rates and just run the market as they wish. I have spoken a lot already, so I think it's time for me to stop and I'll take questions should you have any later on, of course, in the later part of this conference. I will give you back the floor because the other people have things, you know, very interesting things to say. Thank you. Merci, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. Let me now give the floor to Barbara Gomez, who is a doctor on private law and specialist on platforms and uberization. She will talk about um, the European corpus, about the legal stakes here. And she will also, also talk about the proposal of directive I presented to uh, Commissioner Schmidt a few weeks ago. And Barbara has also had the opportunity to take part in a draft law from for the French Senate, which has shown that it is possible to combine autonomy with uh, social protection. And finally, Barbara is counselor at the city of Paris, and this is why she's here amongst us. She is here in order to talk about the possibilities that are here in order to give a proper framework at city level to these practices. Over to you, Barbara. Merci, uh, merci Thank you. Toi. Thank you, Laila, for deciding to organizing such a webinar and thank you also for uh, putting forward this directive. I wanted to start by thanking you and your staff, which has been remarkable. You've been very serious and it has been very nice to work with you and your team. I think we all enjoyed it and found it very interesting. And, um, and this allowed us to have high expectations and go ahead. I won't talk about today's context and uh, increased poverty. 
more about this economic model offered by these platforms. I'd rather talk about the questions related to uh, rights and the legal framework, because some platforms offer uh, few rights to uh, the workers, but they are very limited and it is very difficult for these workers to truly use and benefit from these um, rights. It's only those who do not have any other choice who remain on these platforms whenever, whenever they are facing uh, pre precarity or uh, other challenges. And more and more associations are pushing for more social justice, but it remains difficult. Trying to tackle this issue in 15 minutes is uh, very tricky. I'll try to uh, be as clear as possible. And if you have questions, we'll be able to talk about it later on. Let me first talk about uh, French jurisprudence and say that today we can see uh, some kind of duel between uh, parliament and uh, the legal framework judges because platforms whenever they arrive on a territory they have a very aggressive approach they want to impose um, new laws within uh, states and they don't want to adapt themselves to existing norms so how do the french mps react to this a few days ago in Santé au Travail, a French paper, we could read that under the pressure of intensive lobbying, it looks like... Uh, MPs tend to negle neglect their, their obligations and judges forget to their obligations uh, here. And this Duel explains the timeline we have been witnessing lately. Indeed, we, things started with the law of 2016 on work, which talked about platforms which aimed at putting in touch workers and employers, platforms which were supposed to be there in order to be some kind of broker, intermediary but we'll dig into detail later on. And these platforms seem to give a few rights related well to the activities carried out and not rights related to the status of wage earners. Then the European Court of Justice has been mentioned and we've had uh, well, the taxi versus Uber decision, which has been very interesting. And a working platform such as Uber is not a platform, an intermediary. They organize a service, they define it from A to Z. And in the end, um, the digital platform is merely an accessory. And actually, uh, the French law of 2016 was not in face with reality. Then a new law emerged on the future, uh, professional future, the La Loi Avenir Professional, which aimed at uh, safeguarding and securing these platforms so that, well, an economic model could well be developed. And um, this uh, law did aim at reinforcing these illegal mo models rather than uh, defending workers. And actually, later on, another decision from court emerged in November 2018 and this decision has been taken over by the Court of Appeal in Paris and reused on March the 4th. And things are crystal clear. Working platform, take it easy, and 
uh, Uber are employers because there is a contractual relationship between these platforms and workers. But this hasn't been enough for MPs. MP will then put forward another article in a law of 2019. And there, the Constitutional uh, Council centered um, the logic from this carter and limited the power of judges. I won't dig into details because it's quite technical, but the thing is that uh, platforms could decide to draw uh, a manifesto and then following certain measures and some kind of supposed negotiations, well then judges cannot check compliance in any way and nor uh, requalify contracts in true working contracts. So as I have said, in the 4th of March 2020, uh, the court stated that there was a true binding relationship between workers and these platforms, the court communicated in French, English, Spanish, and said that, well, there was a true relationship and the judges insisted that they did not ha have the duty to make, well, the status of the workers to evolve, that MPs had to do that, that judges were there just to apply, apply law. And Uh, Jean-Yves Foin intervened then because, well, the uh, parliament wanted, well, to protect platforms vis-à-vis -vis their duties. And this has been explained by Arthur Aim. So I won't talk about this much more, but I just want to stress one thing. Indeed, the report makes it impossible to apply the status of wage earner to workers of these platforms. But the re report says it clear clearly, recognizing the status of wage earner would have one advantage, the advantage of uh, solving all the issues uh, on uh, the rights of the workers and uh, protection of uh, workers would be expanded. This would be a very easy solution and would clarify things, but uh, government seems to disagree. And in order to protect the economic model of platform, some rights are granted to workers, but they are not given in any way a status of wage earner and mechanisms are put into place, even though they make things more complex. And this sounds quite irrational, to say the least. And mm, which portage and cooperatives are put forward, well, to uh, have some kind of mm, safeguard and net. But meanwhile, platforms do not are not responsible and other stakeholders are becoming responsible and have to step in where platforms should do something and carry the can and as dominic meda has said it looks like we are going ahead in a dystopia and this world is a world where workers would be independent freelancers and they would be working with, but actually for uh, big companies who simply mm, do not want to act as employers. And as a consequence, while well, managing staff 
and it's not needed anymore for these platforms and furthermore well uh, social security is not uh, granted anymore and um, healthcare is not provided anymore as a consequence well we are tackling here a paramount question which is intertwined with the future we want for our society and i think we need to pay attention to this then on uh, the draft law 717 from fabian Gay and pascal Savideri. well this proposal wanted to uh, offer assimilation. Assimilation is something well known in labor law. It allows to say that mm, a job can be protected. And actually, everything would have could have been applicable more or less thanks to um, this law, there would have been some duties for the employers, the more or less all, more or less, well, the same taxes for all workers, depending well on, on several elements and um, platforms would have been protected as well. Uh, uh, there would have been some protections in case of layoffs and so on, but uh, there would ha also have been collective negotiations. Uh, this proposal also wanted mm, to create an architecture for a proper legal framework. Mm. And uh, new um, assistance could have helped so the, a, a true toolbox was offered by law 717 in order to grant more autonomy and more uh, more safety also for workers and employers now let's talk about the directive this directive follows the logic of the uh, proposal and that's why this directive is very ambitious We've also talked about the transparency directive. The transparency directive is quite interesting and can help can help workers showing that well they are working in the EU for a given platform. We wondered lately whether or not a platform working for a food delivery platform could be considered as a wage earner. And if um, the way they worked was well in line with uh, well in line with the contract which binds an employer with a wage earner. And the court did not say that workers were mm, wage earners and the European Court of Justice wanted to ask national judges to check whether or not there was a true independence from uh, workers vis-a-vis -vis these platforms. It's quite a tricky question and harmonizing EU rules could be useful. It has been stressed uh, in Article 1 in the proposal of directive and under other articles as well. And this directive works on the scope. It is very important to define the scope of these platforms uh, and law 717 also tackles the scope, which is very paramount for France. And we have very well defined uh, digital platforms. We are talking about online platforms, uh, which put in, in touch indeed workers with uh, different uh, bodies. And here we talk about 
a workforce which is touch in touch with uh, different um, bodies as well, because there is a true difference between uh, these platforms and true brokers in their media race. One can be an artist and sell uh, their sculptures or their paintings online, but it is something very different. One can uh, craft things and uh, sell uh, things online, but this is very different from what these uh, supposed intermediaries, these digital platforms do. And then, very briefly, because I think that I don't have much time left, all the rights of EU workers should be uh, applied to uh, workers of digital platforms. Um, this would be a threshold throughout Europe, and I think we need to push for this. And the directive also um, wants to impose to member states um, uh, uh, a better definition of workers of these digital platforms. And they want to go beyond the algorithm and um, the discrimination which can um, uh, be induced by these algorithms, as it has been explained earlier. And finally, on the alternatives in a nutshell, I want to say that um, there is a project from COP Cycle, which has been mentioned by Arthur, which aims at, well, allowing concierge to uh, have access to uh, legal, social, and administrative support so that uh, the poorest workers can be helped. That's it for me. Thank you. Eh bien, merci beaucoup, Barbara, pour uh, cet exposé très complet, malgré le, le, le temps. I thank you, Barbara. It, it was a very interesting presentation, although we didn't have enough time. We'll now give the floor to my colleague, Sylvie Brunet, who is a member of the European Parliament, Parliament, member of the Renew Group, who is a member of the Social Affairs and Employment Committee at the European Parliament. She was the chairwoman of the Employment and Labour uh, Committee of the um, uh, European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union, and today she will speak about the working conditions of um, workers uh, on the digital platforms. I know that Sylvie has to leave us by 5 p.m., so you will not be able to attend the debate. We'd like to thank you for the time you're sharing with us. All right. Good evening, everyone. Just a slight correction. So um, I don't have my appointment anymore because of COVID, so I'm home here and fine in southern France and I'm not going to move, so I have all the time it takes, okay? And I will be answer to uh, be able to answer all your questions should you have any. Leila, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I would like to say thank you for different reasons because we're not in the same political group to start with, and I very much appreciate this uh, show of uh, appreciation, and it shows that at the European Parliament, we're all able to work together, although we don't have the same points of view, maybe. It's easier to work there together than in a more national context where our national parties tend to oppose more. So I very much appreciated this invitation. So in a few words, I tried to explain the calendar to explain to you how things will move in the coming months, because I'm rather a specialist in labor matters for France and for social negotiations. By the way, as you said, Leila has spent uh, nine years of the Economic and Social Committee. I was in charge of the Employment Committee, and we worked with the government at the time. We made uh, an opinion on the freelance work, on self-employed work. It was a very hard opinion to give at the time because it's a very complex issue for different matters, by the way. Now we are on the European stage, so it's a different ball game, and, and we should show more humility because we are 27 member states with different cultural backgrounds, of course, and uh, Leila will not contradict me. I'm sure social matters are not easy matters. 
because every time we want to speak about social matters when it comes to employment and other social matters, people at the EU level tell us it's about the member states' competences and not ours at the EU level. So it's not a European policy. So it takes a lot of time and energy to fight, to move with your group and make sure you have more social convergence and especially on those matters. So you see this requires a lot of efforts. So in the employment committee, it was decided that we would work on an initiative report. It's not a legal uh, lawmaking report. It's not a draft directive either, because as Laila said, we don't have this competence to initiate uh, the legal process with the European Parliament, but somehow the work I need to do will influence the future text of the EU directive. And I hope we get one because there's a first question, do we want an EU text? Yes, I do want a text, an EU directive, which will be binding for the different member states. I expect a text, I wish for one, for all the reasons you've explained, because we see the legal uncertainty so far, and we work on a case-by-case -case basis based on the case law. And so there is a lot of uncertainty or insecurity, including for the platforms, by the way. Not all platforms should be trashed and some are making efforts. Okay, let's say that in Europe, some of them are doing it and all say we cannot move on like that. Now, so that's the first question mark. It's about the legal uncertainty. So an initiative report to start with. This report should reach the committee level around the 23rd of February. Once it's translated, it's an English translation. Uh, okay, because we're working in English so far, because it's a dominating language at the EU Parliament and in many other places, of course, so we have to make do with that. And so we have some time for amendments. So let's say beginning of March. So this takes us to a vote in May because we need to enter this dialogue with the shadow reporters, that's reporters from other political groups. So a lot of work, it's about dialogue, exchange, it's very dear to me, I want to listen to different viewpoints. And of course, well, one will say something and the other one will say the exact opposite. And then we'll have a vote in the plenary session around June or July. This should lead to having the main lines of the next directive. Commissioner Smith said end of 2021 for a directive on the working conditions for platform workers. Also, it's about social protection, their, their rights and so on and so on. So how did I deal with that? Well, first there were some hearings. We heard many people and organizations who work on that. ILO, the ILO, whose uh, representatives I met recently, they're preparing a report at the ILO. This ILO report should be ready by mid-February. So this is somehow the same timeline. Unfortunately, we don't have it yet. They're working on a global scale. And they are thinking, they're thinking about what needs to be done with these new types of labor and what type of protection we can provide at the social level, how we can provide enough social protection for all these workers. So, well, so far, there aren't many workers in these um, uh, labor patterns, including in the EU. We don't have precise figures. We know 15, one five percent of freelance workers when you look into the 2015 studies but how many are actually platform workers we're not sure so it's hard to get precise figures now in spite of all this we should also be aware of the fact that this is part of the labor's context of development the digital world is there ai is also growing you know artificial intelligence is growing so what happens tomorrow when a robot gives you an order? Who's the true employer? How will it work? So we are at a crossroads, you know. We cannot actually stop this development. We should not actually 
live without that because it will create jobs with the digital activity, but we need to be extremely careful so that we don't have a, did a society at two levels with more vulnerable workers who are less protected because they need to be flexible. So I really think this is what is at stake here. Now, principle five of the European social rights is important. And this is something that must be turned into something much more concrete. And um, the lawyer spoke before, so said it clearly. This is part of the continuity of existing texts. We, did, we have the directive on the transparency working conditions. It's a great step forward for 2019 and other directives like directive on temporary work because this is not something we've mentioned so far, but we have had a lot of feedback on that. It's also about unfair um, a competition with all the types of labor, like temporary work, temp work, which is very regulated even at the European level, by the way. So tempers, temporary workers are in a situation where they are wage earners and they're hired by the, the temp companies. And today, more and more work platforms appear and grow and they give people a mission. These are supposedly freelance workers or self-employed or small entrepreneurs, but they are facing the exact same conditions as a temporary work uh, agency, but they don't get protection as temp workers or they don't even get a contract, you know, or they don't have the constraints. So this is a through theme. And I spoke with people at the committee and they hear feedback about this worldwide because temporary work is very regulated. So we don't see clear borders to this theme, but of course we need to legal movement on that. So what shall we have to deal with? With our report, I'm not gonna say my report, it's our report, uh, which will lead to a directive. Well, what should we focus on? Well, as said, we want to reach true protection against algorithm. We want transparency. We want information because algorithms are there. If they evolve, workers don't actually know, they don't understand the consequences for their work, for their uh, income. So it's a big theme that we seem to agree on. We need to truly improve that, especially transparency and shed a clear light on algorithms. Then there's another item where we get everybody's support. That's about the status. It's always about the status, the status. You know, it's an, and it is a risk if you directly focus about the status instead of speaking about rights, minimum rights that need to be respected. We don't want a third status. We, we've clearly heard that, including from countries that create a specific status, by the way. So there are two main statuses today. We have uh, uh, self-employed workers in the European Court of Justice has defined it more clearly, more than uh, um, wage uh, earners. And then you have the work relationship. It's an interesting concept because we speak about the work relations and not actually uh, another concept. Um, we have to see how this relation works. Um, we, is it about employed work or not? No, it's about work relations. We don't speak about employed work. I'm looking at my watch, time's flying, but also, I would like to say that one of the main themes we have to deal with is that we need to set a perimeter. When you say platform workers, well, it's quite scary because it's broad, okay? So as said, we need to clearly define, you know, clearly define relations, intermediaries, it's not just about an intermediary to get them or market share or a client. No, it's about something else. And it's about setting the price. You know, workers do not set their price or their rates autonomously. So there should be sanctions. San the platforms can be sanctioning the workers. So it's a broad definition of platform workers. And we are very present though, focusing on sec two sectors, persons, transport and deliveries with very different issues actually from a sector to another because when it comes to food delivery or meals delivery, well, 
or, or persons transport, these are very different working conditions and constraints. So let's look into the definitions. And for a directive, we'll be asked to be quite broad, have a broad approach. We should not have a directive that will focus on two sectors only, you know, that will provide a framework for only two sectors. We need to think in a broader fashion at the European level. Otherwise, we will fail and people will say, look, this is too, too detailed. Take a broader scope, make sure it's applicable in all member states. Otherwise, people will just say, look, this is not viable and it's a competence for the member states. So this is the context we're dealing with. And we'll move forward, of course, because next February we'll have a text and the text will be uh, well, relying or be inspired by many existing texts already. I hope I didn't speak too much. Thank you for your attention anyway. Well, thank you, Sylvie. Now we'll go to Spain and we'll listen to Francisco Trio Baraga. Francisco Trio Baraga. Uh, well, there, the Minister for Labor, Yolanda Diaz, has been working on a proposal to support the working conditions of platform workers and their status. And Francisco will tell us more about this, but they will expect that there would be a concept of um, employed worker and these people will get the same rights as other wage earners. And what's interesting in, in Spain is that the third status that was referred to already exists. It has existed for years before the arrival of platforms. The trad day status, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bad translation, but it's an economically the independent status worker, worker status. But we see now the political need to have more regulation for platform workers in Spain. So Francisco will clarify that for us. Thank you, Francisco, you have the floor. Bien, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Y en primer lugar, me gustaría agradecerle. Hello, welcome everybody. So it's good to participate in this wonderful webinar. This will be dealing with some of the key issues in the area of uh, work in the EU and around the world, in fact. So work for digital platforms is one of the key expressions of globalization in economic terms that we're witnessing today. Thank you for the fantastic political work from the European Parliament group, the, the left in the European Parliament. Thank you for making the proposal for the directive. We're getting to know it. So the title of this webinar or what we're looking for is finding legislative solutions at the European level. For this, we need to interpret the economic, social and legal conflicts that exist. Co those caused by the current situation of platform workers. I would like to draw your attention to something. We must have got things rather wrong. We're talking about an independent worker, a freelancer, having no rights. How can this be? So subordinates uh, in various countries, I'm not talking about whether they are platform workers, but how can you contract uh, in freelancers without them having rights? That, that's a big question as well. So there are three factors I think we need to take into account to interpret the conflicts I have mentioned. Firstly, so we talk about digital, the digital platform economy, previously the collaborative economy. This appeared at a particular moment in time politically. There was a big economic and political crisis in the European project. The Commission was talking about this, the collaborative economy, now the platform economy. It was a particular context. There was uh, the austerity crisis to deal with. So really, there's continuity. It's continuing with the business 
plans from uh, the time of austerity. People often say that we should not pay too much attention to this phenomenon of platform work, the gig economy. They say it's a low percentage of the economy and of workers. However, labor and regulation and platform work are hiding something else. There's a political project for regulation of work. So we need to think about a third factor. So Leda Chevy made this point very well today. She was saying progress is being made on platform work, particularly during lockdown, but any economic activity can be subject to a kind of platformizing process, any kind of economic activity. So I will insist on these three factors. So the context in which this form of economy uh, was generated, so the political project behind it, and finally, it is continuing the austerity-based regulation of labor. The entire economy can become platformized. So Spain, that's what I am here to explain briefly. Spain is a fantastic example. You can see it very clearly. There's a fight between uh, autonomous work, so freelance work and salaried work, em employment. It's a historical conflict. So in 2012, there was a reform. Essentially, this affects this legal battle on what is freelance work and what is employment. So uh, big lawyers, count, uh, practices have been uh, involved in this, they advise big digital platform companies. They are the people who will be drawing up strategies for court cases to try and ensure that platform work is seen as freelance work. So what's the context? I'd like to stress this. There's been a complete abject failure of public labor policy and the business system in Spain. There is mass unemployment at the moment. So public policy has pushed people or pushed millions of workers into freelance work, self-employment. So what is the effect of this? So really, it's a cultural shift as well. So these uh, big lawyers firms are working in the legal arena. They're trying to make sure that platform work is seen as freelance work. We need, uh, there can be a collective response. There is this response from trade unions and uh, platform workers. It's an alliance, collective action, that's really based on legal intervention by trade unions. So this is together with good working, like work inspection work. This can, as Barbara said, give a perfect description of exactly how work is being done. It can also detect fraud where um, the right status isn't being used. It can also intervene in payment of social security, of social security payments from platform companies, which haven't been done. So there's a legal battle in both cases. It's to do with the legal nature of the work being done. So it's said that platform workers provide their own production means. Maybe it's 
uh, a bicycle for delivery. They also supposedly can decide when they work and under what conditions. So those are the two legal arguments brought in Spain in court cases regarding the situation. Well, in January 2020, the government changed, as you know. This brought a coalition between Unidas Podemos and the Socialist Party, and Yolanda Diez, the Labour Minister, took her first action. She said she wanted to regulate digital platforms. In her view, it's a key example of a precarious situation at work. So she was saying there had to be a law against false freelancers. This should be general. There's pressure from the economy minister and from uh, platform associations. This meant that it became much less ambitious. The law was then restricted to platform workers. So she became less ambitious. So then in September last year, 2020, the Supreme Court of Spain finally gave a verdict. It said that platform workers, mainly delivery workers like Glovo, delivery uh, and, and delivery workers mainly, as well as professional drivers for Uber and others, Cabify, for example, are in fact salaried workers, employees. This resolved a legal issue that had been dragging on for about four years. This meant that the Spanish government then set up a social dialogue round table. So I'm reaching the end here. So what is this text that's coming through now? A few key aspects. Firstly, there's a need for transparency. This means that re uh, workers' representatives should know about the systems for organizing work. So the times, setting fees, even when there's an algorithm to determine how those systems work. What does this mean? So workers' representatives have the right to know how the algorithm determines uh, the, the system for work. What are the criteria? Secondly, this legal debate has sought to establish who is self-employed and who isn't. So who is an entrepreneur, a self-employed person? This is uh, the laws being negotiated now. The first thing is the person employing others. This gets away from the polarized uh, debate between self-employed and salaried worker. So using jurisprudence from European courts, we can see an employer is the main agent in the market. So this means the agent that can really act and intervene in the market resolving any doubts about uh, the labor relations. So this uh, draft law says, when controls are done, it should be clear, be it through an algorithm or work flexibility, apparently at least. Apparent flexibility would make you think that the workers are free to set their working conditions. However, the reality is different. They don't have this freedom 
because there are negative consequences when they choose working conditions that do not tally with what the platform wants. So, of course, attention is paid to uh, delivery workers platforms. So they would come under this status of workers. So the courts and the Supreme Court in Spain have determined that they are not, so they are neither autonomous nor uh, in another status. So I won't take up too much time now. So we want a, a tripartite observatory to look at this. So with government, social representatives, trade unions, and employers associations. So we can really look into this over a set period. We want to see how this is developing in terms of platform work in Spain. So thank you very much for listening. I will be happy to answer questions later. Merci beaucoup, Francisco. Uh, je vais désormais passer la parole Thank à you, Jean Francisco. I will now give the floor to Jean-Yves Point, former chair of the social chamber of the of the court in France, and he has been mandated by the prime minister in France for a special mission to think about the working condition and the status of uh, digital platform workers. His report has been expected for a very long time. And uh, sir, you have the floor. Please talk us about uh, your assignment and the conclusions, obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chaibi. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure I have much more to say, actually, because uh, Madame Gomez and Mr. Hay have already talked about my report. But it may be useful to talk about the conditions in which I was asked to uh, carry out uh, this mission. And it may be interesting to talk also about the context in which I carried it out. Let me bounce back on what Madame Gomez just said about uh, French law. I have been asked to do this work in the framework of the law on mobility and in line with mm, the mm, spirit of this law. In 2016, a special mention to digital platform workers was made they were uh, they were considered as freelancers and it has been said that platforms would choose their workers and the tariff had to respect uh, some social criteria and on december the 24th of 2019 an additional law was published the question is not to know whether we agree with it or not. The question is rather about uh, on the uh, regulation uh, and auto regulation of these platforms because uh, independence of workers must be guaranteed and their status of freelancer uh, had to be uh, preserved through this law. And furthermore, platforms should have to define duties and responsibilities of platforms and workers. And as a consequence, well, a binding agreement on the, the elements of the charter. Government was well aware of the fact that such a system would be very fragile, that such a document would be unilateral, and that's why in the law of 2019, MPs envisaged 
a one year transition period so that a true social dialogue would emerge and regulate the relationship between workers and platforms. And it's based on this text and because of this context that I was given this special mission to prepare a report for the social dialogue. The thing is that, it has, as it has been mentioned by Madame Gomez, many ex unexpected things happened. First of all, one of the highest courts in France made it impossible to write uh, such charters, and then another court requalified the working contract of an Uber driver so that all these workers would be considered as mm, wage earners. And as a consequence, well, uh, my mission became less important with the 2019 law aiming at a social dialogue. The aim was, well, to recognize that uh, there was a lack of balance between employer and worker, but then also, well, to recreate a true balance between these two parties. So, bearing this in mind, and after the decision taken on Uber, which was well, surprised government and MPs, who then started talking about a third status, well, during my mission, government envisaged the, the creation of a second mission to ask whether or not it could be useful to create a third status. It took some three months to do that. It was also because of, well, the health crisis induced by COVID. And the government decided to expand my mission so that I would have to think about, well, the social dialogue, but also carry out a reflection on the most adequate status for uh, digital platform workers and the potential uh, creation of a third status. Furthermore, I was asked to think about reinforcing uh, social law for digital platform workers. And finally, I was asked to talk about the unique, uh, unique status which goes beyond uh, the statuses of freelancer and wage earner, a unique status which would give the same and equal rights to both categories. As a consequence, I was at first supposed to focus only on social dialogue and then needed to uh, wear very different hats and tackle other issues on the social dialogue, but also on reinforcing um, uh, protection of digital platform workers and um, other leads for uh, maybe a unique status or a third status at least. And this is why, well, I needed more time to uh, draft my report because in the end, in, instead of only tackling one question, I needed to tackle three or four. So, content-wise, we started by asking ourselves several questions on the status because First, we needed to know if we needed to keep this status of freelancer or if we needed a third status. And we, as a consequence, asked ourselves whether or not it was necessary to 
um, give a status of wage earner for these digital platform workers. We talked about these different possibilities in the report and tackled different alternatives. On the existing solutions, we could have a freelancer status and uh, reinforce the safeguards for digital platform workers. We could have the wage earner status for all or uh, create a third status. We rejected the creation of a third status because, well, this possibility had already been rejected by government earlier on. and. Mm, the reasons which led to this rejection were still valid today. And then we observed that countries which had a third status actually did not make those digital platforms workers migrate to a this third status, but actually tried to find other legal means to uh, preserve the status of freelancer for these workers. And this was interesting to us and showed that a third status wasn't useful at all. As a consequence, we thought about recognizing the status of wage earner for all the workers of digital platforms. And Barbara Gomez was right to remind what I said in my report. I did not Right, the fact that this solution could uh, be uh, useful because it could help us well, guarantee social rights ex and expand these rights to the digital platform workers. But the thing is that this was not the main objective of my mission. If it had been, well, then obviously I would have focused on that. Then the thing is that giving such a status um, to these workers could have a major impact on digital platforms and employment. Furthermore, and this is the lead we put aside big parts. Actually, I think that a vast majority of uh, drivers were against such a status. I am a legal expert and I know we should not take into account um, expectations of uh, the wider pu public when it comes well to um, drafting such a report. But we thought that, well, this opinion was valuable and we understood that uh, drivers were deeply attached to their autonomy. And I thought that it was necessary to explore other possibilities. And this is why I dig into, I dug into details. The tiers porter, uh, dont les travailleurs des plateformes seraient les, les salariés. Alors, je n'ai pas inventé. And uh, tried to understand, well, what we could do with umbrella companies, several bodies, uh, French authorities and even the Jean Jaurès Foundation tackled the possibility of using umbrella companies and said, well, the, an umbrella company mm, could be useful, even though, well, the umbrella company model was difficult to expand. But I heard Arthur A and Barbara who opposed themselves to such a model. And on the other hand, Dominique Beda in uh, Le Monde said that it was an interesting model. And I must say that I agree with him. Anyhow, that's it for the status. 
and I think I have talked quite a, a lot of time, so that's it. And if you have any questions, well, I remain at your disposal. Thank you, Mr. Juan. Let me say that there are many questions uh, for you on the chat, questions on umbrella companies. I hope we'll have the possibility to uh, talk about that, bearing in mind that we need to finish by 6 p.m. We still have two people who need to take the floor. Yes, I said it myself, Madame Shaibi. I will have to leave uh, quite quickly. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, it's true. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I guess that uh, Barbara can also tackle the questions on umbrella companies. Anyway, let me now give the floor to Danielle Obono, MP at l'Assemblée Nationale in France. She's from La France Insoumise. And she co-drafted a report on social protection of workers uh, of platforms. Daniel, you have the floor. Daniel, ah. Hello, do you hear me? It's well, thank you very much for, I hear you, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, we do. Lovely. Go ahead. We do hear you, Daniel. Go ahead. Oui, c'est l'animateur qui m'a arrêté la vidéo, mais je ne sais pas pourquoi, peut-être parce que le... jusqu'à présent, tout, tout marchait bien. So we hear her perfectly. Enfin, moi, je, je peux... Je peux But je I peux can continue. Yes, go ahead. Usually when there is no image, it's complicated for the interpreters, but apparently interpreters want you to go ahead without image. So let's move on. D'accord, excusez-moi. Sorry about that. Thank you to all of you. And I want to talk about the work we carried out with Carole Grandjean and talk about the conclusions presented last week. Uh, all of this will be available. Well, it's actually avail already avail available on the website of the French Parliament. So, our report was drafted in the framework of or a Commission on EU Affairs. I am not a specialist on the social law. I am rather special, specialized on uh, law, but this topic seemed very important to me. And when we started this report, just before lockdown, actually, Mm. We wanted to go ahead quickly, but obviously we've had to make do with COVID and working on platforms has been challenging in such con con conditions. And the crisis exacerbated mm. the consequences of digital platforms and their relationship with uh, courses and drivers. Thanks to this report, we were able to put forward the economic model of platforms. And before I talk about, well, my recommendations, which are modest, if I may say, I'd like to talk about the political framework. Actually, you have to know that 
As other speakers have said, today, we have to try to create a framework for uh, digital platforms while we make do with a political context and a neoliberalism. And as a consequence, protecting social welfare is tricky, especially for these workers. And there is a true opposition between the laws which have been mentioned until now, the law on mobility orientation and so on, because these laws aim at deregulation. And this because well of the of neo neoliberalism and its ideology and the majority within the governments in Europe. Because today in Europe, we try to recover some economy activity at the expense of workers. And therefore, it is complicated to create a proper framework for digital platforms. Right. So, I think that with all the colleagues, we, we've been working on this for a certain period of time now at the European level. And it's interesting to see that in several EU member states, we're facing the same political difficulties, not just legal difficulties, because you have the case law that tends to support a, a new status, but now we are facing political difficulties in the parliaments. And there's a position between national law and the EU law. So there's one way out of it. And it's about doing what we're doing now in France, where sending the ball back to the European level and say, look, just make a directive. And then we'll transpose the directive as we can with all the member states in the best fashion possible with the necessary margin for maneuver to actually, uh, well, do something uh, that provides minimum protection without having a systematic uh, employee status or another type of status. This is what I'm trying to say here. This is actually the translation of the type of political responsibility by the governments that send the ball back to the EU level to make sure they have the necessary framework. But at the same time, they still have a deregulation rationale and a reduction of protection for workers. So you see, this is a more general uh, reflection. This is not the the flavor of the report that we've introduced or tabled, but here we worked on the presentation of the economy of platforms and the diversity uh, of this economy. So a big part of the report deals with the series of observations. So it's very interesting indeed. Here we wondered about the European scale or dimension and the platform economy. And we're trying to also explain that we have a technological tool, which is still something new. It is quite unknown. That's what they claim. But when it comes to work relations, subordinate work, or working conditions, we end up with activities which are already well known and done in presence. So somehow there's nothing new under the sky when it comes to uh, supporting this opposition of classes, you know, on the platforms. Now, there are specific themes which are due to the very nature of the tool, that's the online platforms, but also the status of nature of the workers. Also, we focused a lot on this type of typology. We also tried to take into account everybody's viewpoints. because this is what we do when we do co-reporting work. We try to listen to each other. And here, of course, we try to take everybody's opinion into account and take into account also the European case law. 
and we heard what was said about Spain or Italy, the rootings in France. Well, all that tends to support that there will be a requalification, as we call it. We also heard Mr. Fra, also his, uh, we read his report that came out just before ours. And thanks to that, we could end this true-false debate on the third status. Now, as it was well explained, the political framing there was such that it would have the possibility to go farther. Now, personally speaking, and I didn't do it alone, but there was this bill that was introduced by my colleagues at the Senate, the French Senate. So they wanted to do something that would correspond to what already exists and would provide for the necessary uh, recognition in France. But the general conclusions of our report do not say who should be supported or not, because there's a European dimension, which is really to be reckoned with here. And the final conclusion is that the balls should be sent back to the EU level again, as you said before. Now here, we're uh, pointing at a series of questions and factors. It's all about the transparency of algorithms as explained before. So it's a, a source of discrimination. It is also a management tool that we see today in the work relations, also in the relation between workers and their work, their job. And with these tools, this is something that can actually come out of the digital platforms. This tool can actually be used in other sectors, not only the digital economy, you know. So management teams with this algorithm can actually do other things and it's being tested out uh, in other sectors because this technology is applicable to other sectors, to all workers actually. And so we need to pay particular attention to that. Now, our conclusion and my conclusion for now is that we need to rethink our international approach and use the ILO work. It was mentioned before, we had contact with a representative from ILO in France, and we said that the directive would be necessary to provide a, a good framework that would support different social models. Also, personally, I think it is necessary to use the most protective level of framework to improve the EU legislation and not actually water it down by giving everyone the possibility to organize it in their own ways. But I think this is what's going to happen now at the EU level. So I'll stop now. I'll stop now and I say thank you. Thank you for this exchange. And maybe I'll have uh, the possibility to answer some of your questions later on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Daniel. I will now give the floor to Maria Dapaz uh, Campos Lima, and she'll speak about the Portuguese situation because we know that this. Uh, wage portage or, um, is a concept that comes from Portugal. Mary, I have the floor in Portuguese. Um, muito boa tarde a todos. Uh, Good afternoon, people. everyone. I am very happy to be here learning a lot, and that's very important for Portugal. The Portuguese experience seems to echo others. With what they called um, wage portage, or, or that we call uh, wage portage in the English expression. Uh, 
So the fact that in Portugal no, no temos essas... In Portugal, we don't have the expression um, wage portage. So the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm surprised. Well, anyway, I do recognize that the Portuguese case maybe is the one that is closest to the concept of wage portage or what we can also call uh, wage transportation. Because creatively, what the Portuguese legislation created in 2018 was a solution through which there are four entities, the platforms, the hiring companies, which are not the platforms themselves, workers who have um, service providing contracts or work contracts and the clients or the users. Very well. I call this relation a quadripartite relationship. While the relationship, which is the most common or the one that we discuss more frequently is the relationship through which the platforms and the um, those who deliver the services are one entity and the relationship established the the binding relationship whether through uh, a work contract or a service providing contract are considered then the deliverers of the service Very well. So in Portugal, what happens is we have um, some a sort of different relationship through which platforms, which has, are known as TVDE operators, and here I'm talking about the individual transport of passengers, these have no responsibility as an employer or as a social entity so they are considered intermediaries they're not considered employers they are intermediaries and they define the rules of the game whether it is related to tariffs tariffs charged uh, time of work and the distribution of work among drivers. And the third entity created are hiring companies or hiring employers, which are collective entities, which are the um, drivers themselves. They establish contracts with the platforms But somehow, these contracts do not bind um, the workers to the platforms. So these TVD partners, which are these collective entities, they are the ones who frequently hire the drivers. They are um, entrepreneurs, they are self-employed people who can establish service providing contracts or work contracts with the workers, the drivers. And I think Portugal is a very complicated example and wage portage or this umbrella company might mean something else in Portugal. 
normally the concept of wage portage was not initially linked to platforms. We have had some experiences of um, artist corporate cooperatives who have a labor uh, binding relationship or some sort of by law in terms of uh, wages and work conditions, but at the same time, they are self-employed. They have their own individual missions. So wage portage was connected to that. But when we transfer this to the platforms, the question is a lot more complex because the platforms are powerful. I am going to go ahead and just emphasize, first of all, that there have been progresses in Portugal. We have been protecting self-employed people a bit more. We have recognized um, we, we've been trying to recognize bogus self-employment. We consider uh, the work contracts and the service providing contracts as two different things that can be very clearly differentiated. We also consider um, self-employed people and their uh, income when they work to certain entities. But the problem is not just the, the entities and the labor relationship, it's also the bylaw of uh, companies. And the umbrella company can be a problem here. We need to, we need to note that the idea of a company or a collective entity can't be made liable. You can't copy um, an organization that already exists, for example, in the world of taxis in Portugal. It has to do uh, with, for example, um, workers that are self-employed and organize themselves or I believe that in 2018 there has been a lobby and a movement from taxi drivers in 2018 and facing this process they um, wanted to uh, raise the flag with the Uber drivers. And legislation, the legislators have to understand that the workers, they can organize themselves, so have a contract with companies that are not actually companies, they are collective organizations. They have that responsibility, but they have no control over anything. So platforms have no transparency. They don't know how work is distributed, how tariffs are charged. And these are the main key points that I mean by these um, companies, these umbrella companies have no real role. They are a collective entity that has no say. They contract or they hire workers and they have no option on what to do with a worker when, for example, they are their contract is terminated with the platform. The platform determines the way that the work uh, is distributed, um, the tariff, who stays and who goes. In November, 
November last year, there were protests and mobilizations from uh, umbrella companies and also from drivers because Uber has introduced a, a new initiative due to the, pan, the pandemic because there has been a reduction in um, obviously in trips and they've reduced prices for that and tariffs are now completely uh, dumped in social terms. On the other hand, the determination and control of the working uh, schedule or working time, this is completely out of the, um, the say, framework of these collective entities. Workers can be negatively assessed by passengers and can be blocked by the platform and the umbrella companies can't do anything about that. Union mediation is still um, at the beginning. It's very difficult for these drivers to be able to talk to platform representatives. And on the other hand, the workers who have a work contract are not the majority. Indeed, platforms have no legal responsibility from the labor and social point of view. These are on the umbrella companies, including contributions for social security. And on the other hand, there is obviously a problem, which is the absence of impact assessment uh, from government bodies. And also, we lack on accessible information on the types of uh, relationships that these companies have with workers. The latest data we've got from 2019, they show or indicate that there were more than 22 million drivers then. This is a very close number to the number of taxi drivers. Now, recent developments, of course, um, there is a legislative initiative being discussed. Some initiatives are trying to bring this question to the public debate. First of all, to discuss what are the roles of the platforms and if it makes sense to have a work relationship with the platform uh, with all the rights that workers need and should have. In the end of uh, the last year, a legislative initiative from the left party in Portugal um, claimed for a direct binding relationship labor relationship between workers and the platform and not through an intermediary company trying to uh, end what we think is very similar to uh, wage portage it hasn't been approved yet but it's in the debate We have been preparing also the Green Book on labor relationships and the government prioritizes the, the discussion of this theme. I hope that we don't forget this Spanish experience and that we can um, discuss this question. We are so close. And I hope we go ahead in this issue. Another few um, interesting elements have to do with the organization of workers through unions. Somehow, it's uh, very important that this happens, but it's still a slow movement. In the case of passenger transportation, uh, we 
we don't have that couriers. They have been working more, but those who transported passengers stopped working all of a sudden. So uh, it's very important that we have uh, a union for that sense. And we need to elaborate claims on our green book with regards to the workers' rights and also the umbrella companies. This is where I will stop. And I would like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Eh bien, uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Maria da Paz Campos Lima. Donc, uh, alors je suis thank vraiment... you very much, Maria. Uh, all these exchanges were very interesting, but unfortunately, we will have to call it to do day very soon. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, our technical support and the interpreters here. We will have to leave by 6 p.m. There have been many questions on the chat, but unfortunately, we won't be able to give the floor to the different people and panelists. I know that some panelists have already tried to answer some questions on the chat. Thank you to all of you. I would just like to mention one article from Dominique Meda, uh, who is amongst us at this webinar as uh, uh, and she's in the public and um, I invite you all to read her article. Many thanks to all of you. I hope that uh, these exchanges have been useful and that they will help us while reinforcing the protection of uh, workers at the level of EU member states and the European Union. Thank you to all the panelists and all of those who uh, assisted to this webinar. Thank you so much. Bye bye.